I, I'm going to chair this as lightly as possible because the idea is for the authors and the discussants to have, uh, have as much time as possible. Uh, so uh, who wants to go first? Andrew, do you want to go first? Sure. Go? Yeah. Well, I mean, you're Andrew, the Andrew, you go okay. first. Andrew Cayley is a distinguished war crimes lawyer. And the kind of things he had done, if I had to do, I'd have committed suicide long ago. So depressing. <laughs> but, uh, he, there are, he, has, he has looked at the ultimate depths of human depravity and still survived, which is faith in truth, which I find very surprising. Anyway, there you are. Thank you. Um, obviously, you know, I'm not one of the authors of this book, so I read it. Um, I've read it, in fact, in the last week. I've sort of been reading 20, 30 pages a day. Um, and I, I've just made some notes here of some of the initial conclusions that I came to on, on reading the book. Um, I think the first conclusion that I came to is it is true, um, not wholly true, that conventional military force failed to stop many of the crimes that I was addressing as a prosecutor at the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal um, and later at the International Criminal Court, certainly crimes that took place in Bosnia, the DRC, Uganda, Darfur, um, and indeed what I'm addressing now in Cambodia that happened nearly 30 years ago, there was absolutely no international intervention at all in respect of those crimes. Um, I do agree with the book's conclusion that a core problem within the world today in, certain, in, in terms of all of these kinds of events is that not enough um, is being done in terms of international development. And by that, I mean, you know, and certainly I'm seeing that now in Cambodia, good governance, clean water, proper housing, uh, the opportunity to work without, without the international community doing more about those issues, um, the environment becomes ripe for ethnic tensions and the kind of violence uh, that, that we've seen in many places around the world. Um, I do believe, and I, and I certainly concluded this after dealing with the crimes that took place in Srebrenica, that had the international community acted with hard force rapidly, those events could have been stopped in their tracks. And indeed, if you look at the end of the war um, in the former Yugoslavia with the bombing of Belgrade, I think it's, it's absolutely true that had the international community acted earlier and harder with military force, many, many lives could have been saved, not just in Srebrenica, but in the former Yugoslavia generally. And then lastly, dealing with an area that I suppose concerns me, um, the, the justice element. Um, it's already been alluded to that, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. And I go through periods of great cynicism and then through periods of, of hope. Um, certainly in Cambodia, I'm finding that even 30 years after events, there is a real cry for justice. You cannot meet anybody in that society who didn't lose somebody during the Khmer Rouge period. Um, even interestingly, a young 25-year-old woman who booked my airline ticket to come here uh, f for this panel. She's, she was born after the Khmer Rouge period, but half of her family perished during that period. I haven't met any Cambodian who hasn't been affected. And if you look at the figures, and I know there is talk of exaggeration, 1.7 million people perished out of a population of 8 million through either murder, forced labor, or starvation. Um, so. Within the book, there, there is a small section on justice being part of the process. And I certainly <coughs> believe that it needs to be part of the solution to all of these kinds of events. It's not the only solution. Um, it can be very costly. Uh, the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal has now cost nearly $1 billion. But I think certainly going to Cambodia has, has actually renewed my faith in the international justice system, um, and certainly people there have great expectations about coming to settle accounts with the remaining members of the regime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, very much. I, I just want to say that 
I've always been astonished that the Cambodian crimes were not committed by bad men or in a fit of passion, not EDM in. It was based on a PhD written at the Sorbonne. It was actually theoretically analyzed that if you want to create a classless society, kill all the classes which are less than the majority. Very simple. That's how you create a classless society. Anyway, having been my contribution. So Mary, <laughs> Mary whom I know uh, and for a long time, is another person who never fails to amaze me because she is both an idealist and an activist researcher. And she too has kind of visited the, the worst you know, battlefields of humanity and retained her faith that argument and passionate advocacy can make a difference. Thank you. <laughs> I thought I would start by saying something about how Shannon and I came to write this book, because it also relates to what you were saying. What we found once we'd met was that we'd actually been through a similar, very similar trajectory, coming almost from opposite ends of the spectrum. I was an academic and a peace activist, and he was a soldier. But in the uh, 1990s, I was the chair of a peace and human rights group called the Helsinki Citizens Assembly. And actually, we had groups throughout Yugoslavia, and it was my job to go and visit those groups. And so I became convinced, before Srebrenica, actually, that you needed military force to protect people, and you had to have a tougher mandate. And at the very moment that I was thinking along these lines, Shannon was in Germany preparing forces to be sent to Bosnia. And he came to the conclusion that although you needed forces, you didn't need the kind of heavy equipment, the tanks and the bombers that you use for a conventional war in Europe if your job was to protect people. <laughs> so we were sort of moving towards each other from completely opposite directions. For both of us, I think Kosovo was a formative moment because I was strongly in favor of the use of force uh, in order to protect people. But actually, what turned out was a bombing raid, which I thought was the wrong means. And that was really the moment when I began to think, I mean, at that time, we talked about humanitarian intervention that humanitarian intervention may involve force, but it can't be traditional war. And there was a sort of liberal interventionist view that uh, there's something called a just war. That's the Tony Blair view. And in a way, military force was a black box. Whereas actually how you do these things was very, very <coughs> important. And for Shannon, he, he was sent there as an army attache. And he was supposed to go around thinking about security in Kosovo. And what everybody told him was what they really wanted was water and electricity and somebody to clear away the rubbish. So that started him off in a completely different. And, and then, finally, he was working for AFRICOM and asked to sort of think about what security means for Africans. And that was the point at which he read some of the work that I'd been doing for the European Union and got in touch with me. And we found we'd, over this period, converged. And the term that I use, although it isn't exactly the same as the way it's used, was human security. But when we use human security, we're not just, I mean, when the UN uses human security, it almost means human development. And of course, development is very important. But actually, there's a crucial problem that we all have to face, which is that people are getting killed in horrible ways in contemporary wars. Terrible war crimes are being committed. And we don't know how to do it, neither doing nothing, as in Bosnia, nor bombing, as in Kosovo, is a way to protect people from war crimes. So what we have been thinking about is what on earth would you do? What would be the right way to protect people? Um, and that's really what the book is very much about. Um, it's about what does it mean really to have. 
And we're very concerned about security at this moment, because when you see what's happening in Afghanistan, um, when you see what's happening in Somalia, when you see what's happening in Congo, these are kind of funny sorts of wars involving cr crime, human rights violations, and they spread. And I think they could spread further with financial crisis, climate change. We need to think of a practical way of dealing with it. And that's really what we try to do. I'll say, before I turn over to Shannon, because I'm trying to be short, I'll say very briefly how we define human security. And I'll say a little bit about Afghanistan. We define human security in, in three ways. I mean, one is that it's about the security of individuals and the communities in which they live and not just about the security of states and borders. It is about the link between freedom from fear and freedom from want. That doesn't mean that we aren't actually still focusing on freedom from fear, in other words, the risk of violence. But actually, it's very, very difficult <coughs> to separate that out from poverty, from homelessness, from all these other things. And thirdly, and I think this is really important, human security is about, if you like, the inside going outside. We're used to thinking of security at home being based on the rule of law and policing, and security abroad being somehow to do with military forces and war. And really, we're talking about a world in which security is more based on the rule of law and policing than it is about war. It's a, if you like, law-based, justice-based, rather than <laughs> war-based. Um, and an example, where actually we were talking about this last night, I mean, we do behave very differently towards people in our own country than we do in Afghanistan. I mean, imagine if after 7-7, we'd sent drone attacks against the homes of the suicide bombers <laughs> in Leeds. It would never have we would never have dreamt of doing something like that. Similarly, when the, when the British Army was dealing with the IRA, we could not bomb Belfast. And actually, I think that was one reason why, to some degree, the whole thing was kept under control. And we're saying, actually, that's how you have to behave in other places. I wanted to say one thing about Afghanistan, because what has happened in the United States as a result of Iraq and Afghanistan, is that some of the, these ideas are, be, are beginning to permeate the Pentagon. And um, Shannon can say more about this. But as you probably know, in the surge in Iraq and in the surge in Afghanistan, the Americans have put more and more emphasis on what they call population security. So is this the same as what we're talking about? Well, it's something that, you know, worried didn't worry me, but <coughs> preoccupied me a lot. I mean, in some ways, I hoped it was the same. But actually, I think there are several problems. I mean, one problem, which is very serious, is that it's seen as a means to an end. Human security is an end in itself. If you're going to do human security in Afghanistan, it is about <coughs> the safety of Afghans. But actually, what's happening in Afghanistan is, is presented at any rate as being about the defeat of America's enemies. It's about the defeat of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And actually, that matters not only in a political sense that Afghans feel they're pawns in a wider game and they don't trust the international community, but it also matters tactically. In the end, Afghan lives are actually sacrificed for the greater goal. And even though collateral damage from airstrikes has declined since McChrystal uh, took over, there have been lots of deaths in night raids. And it just that in the context of war, you are a little bit more casual about human life than you are in the context of human security. And so I think that's the crucial difference. But a lot of other things stem from that. I mean, the whole effort in Afghanistan is very military-led, and it ought to be civilian-led. There's a huge problem, though, which is that the key civilians, Richard Holbrooke or Hillary Clinton, don't get this even less than the military. 
So the military are doing it, but at the same time, it oughtn't to be the military doing it. And, um, well, I could go on, but no, I won't. Don't. I'm going to hand over to Chan. Okay. Yeah. Now, let, let, let me just say one thing about uh, what uh, Mary said about the UN definition of human security and human development uh, and another definition. <coughs> because the most shocking thing about Yugoslavia was, and there are people who will remember it, it was supposed to be the ideal third way between capitalism and communism. Lots of people spend their life idolizing Yugoslavia as the perfect society. And none of us expected that a society where there's not a problem of education or of income, everybody started killing everybody else. So an in, 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 interesting thing is, it's not, it is not true that only poverty leads to these problems. There are other things in life which let people. Anyway, uh, Shannon has a great advantage that I don't know him. <laughs> so I will, I, will not, I will not say anything which may embarrass him. There he is. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, first off, I have to start with a disclaimer uh, that these are entirely my remarks. They're not the remarks or uh, positions of the Department of Defense or the United States Army. Uh, and I, I accept responsibility for everything that I'm about to say. Um, you mean you can't blame Obama for this? I can't, can't, can't blame the administration for this one. But uh, thanks so much to Anna and the Five Books Club and uh, Frontline Club for uh, having me here tonight. It's uh, wonderful to be here in London. I couldn't really think of any place that I'd much rather be than sitting here on stage having a beer uh, and enjoying the, uh, the company. Um, in my mind's eye, I'm someplace very different, though, and I'd like to take you to that place, to some of the experiences that I've had uh, in about 20 to 25 countries that I've traveled to. <laughs> Uh, in Africa. And I'll take you to a place uh, in the eastern Congo, uh, just north of Goma, called the Virunga National Park. That's where we'll start our journey. Uh, a couple of years ago, you'll probably remember that there was a uh, huge article and great shock and outcry across the world uh, for the killing of seven silverback gorillas uh, that were in Virunga National Park. Um, I had done quite a bit of work with, uh, with the uh, conservation community. Uh, my specialty is in environmental security. I was scheduled to go to uh, Eastern Congo uh, around that time anyway. Uh, and so I, I had the opportunity to go there directly following the killing of these seven, uh, seven girls, which are international heritage and, and something to be, to be very concerned about. Um, to me, it was very interesting of how, how much of an outcry that the world gave for, for these seven animals, uh, particularly after I landed in Goma and went up to Virunga National Park and saw some of the conditions that human beings were living in and suffering every single day. Uh, when I went up to Virunga National Park, uh, I saw something that was, was absolutely incredible, and it was uh, rangers, park rangers, uh, that were devoting their lives to protecting these animals against various rebel groups, uh, various poachers, uh, various uh, infringements upon the, uh, the forest themselves. Uh, there was a lot of charcoaling operations going on in the forest, uh, which uh, actually one of the uh, rangers had been hired to kill the gorillas to uh, unseat the uh, manager of the park because the district manager was involved with the charcoal trade and sales, which brought in about $250,000 a year. Uh, there had been uh, between, I think, seven and ten park rangers that uh, de have died uh, within a period of a couple of years trying to protect these animals. All that, and I had the opportunity to visit with the park rangers and see where they lived uh, in, in huts that were probably about half the size of the stage with their entire family. And for that, they possibly got paid about $7 per month uh, if they got paid at all. And somehow they were willing to sacrifice their lives. They were willing to, to put their lives on the line for something that somehow they understood was much greater than themselves. Yet my question was, how was it that seven animals were so much more important than the atrocities that were going on in eastern Congo every single day? The next day I had the opportunity to go back down to Goma and to visit a hospital where they would bring uh, uh, women and, and children uh, in for surgeries because in eastern Congo, uh, a weapon of war, as you might know, is, is rape. Um, women when these rebel groups would go into to various villages, uh, they, would, uh, they would execute them in, uh, but they did not consider, because they only had a limited quantity of, of, uh, of ammunition, uh, they did not consider the women worth uh, the bullet. 
Uh, so they would rape them and kill them that way. Uh, on this particular occasion, I had the opportunity to visit with a little girl that was probably between 13 and 15 years old, and I knew that she had, had been raped probably uh, by 20 to 25 uh, men that were going through this village. Uh, it was very troubling for me uh, as a military officer and, and believing in rules of war uh, and Geneva Convention and those kinds of things. So I didn't want to bring that up because the first question you wanted to ask was what, what exactly happened. But I said that's, that didn't show her any human dignity. So I said, well, what is it that you'd like to be when you, when you grow up? And she smiled and she said, I'd like to be a doctor. And I said, why is that? She said, because everyone here has been so nice to me. And I smiled and I left. Uh, it, was, it was tough. I'd seen quite a bit in over 20 years of military service. Uh, but that night at the hotel, I thought really just the positive, uh, positive spirit that she gave me. And I wanted to go back the next day and talk with her. And uh, so I went back to the hospital uh, the next morning. And they said that she had died of, of injuries uh, that, that evening. And what it brought to me was how is it that one human life was not even worth the price of a piece of lead in a certain part of the world? And how is it that we can put such a low value because of a lack of understanding on some of these lives and some of these places that most of us will never go to? And yet in other parts of the world, this value be so important. How is it that we can value seven animals' lives so much more over the life of this little girl that could have very easily have been a doctor, that could have very easily been pretty much whatever she had wanted to be had she had some of the opportunities that I or any of you have had. That sort of solidified a lot of my thinking as, as I, was, I was beginning to, to write this book with Mary. And I drove in, uh, driving into DC one, uh, one day, and I saw a bumper sticker on the back of a car. And it said, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. <laughs> and I started to very much think about that. And that's a lot of the motivation of this book for me to write is, is there a better way? Uh, a lot of times people, particularly within the humanitarian community and the NGO community, they look and they go, you know, you're a military officer. What, what could you possibly be interested in and, you know, in caring for humans and caring for, you know, for, for their protection and, and development and those kinds of things? It's perhaps counterintuitive, but I, I'm always uh, reminded and I reflect upon uh, what Douglas MacArthur said his final time at West Point, which is my alma mater. He was there to receive uh, the Thayer Award, which is our highest award that we can give at West Point. And the cadets there were asking him, you know, the glories of war and the romance of leading soldiers into combat. And it was Douglas MacArthur, one of our greatest warriors, that shook his head and he said, it is the soldier who first prays for peace, or it is the soldier that first experiences the ravages of war. And so perhaps it is a bit counterintuitive, but it is the soldiers, my soldiers, some of them who have not returned, that I think about. And I always wonder, in the Balkans, was there a better way that we could have done this? In the Middle East, is there a better way that we can do this? In Africa, is there a better way that we can do this? And a lot of times, particularly as it relates to Africa, and that's really where my expertise is, a lot of times our, our foreign policy seems to be somewhat like a kid's, kid's soccer match. We're just sort of chasing whatever the ball, the crisis of the day is and we move from one crisis to the next. And one of the big things today, of course, is the piracy in Somalia. Uh, but if you peel that onion back a couple of layers, you realize this is things that have been going on for a long time. And I always use this adage, uh, which is an old Chinese adage of, you know, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, and you teach a man a fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Well, the corollary to that as it relates to Somalia is what happens when the man is already a fisherman, and you take all of his fish away which is pretty much what has happened in Somalia. As you've, you've since the fall of uh, the government of Somalia back in the early 90s, uh, we have allowed, we, the international community, have allowed uh, these large fishing fleets to go in and absolutely rape the waters off of the coasts. So the question is, what would you do for your family? And I don't think there's a single one of us in here that would say that we would not kill for our family if the need be. And what we've seen very much, and although I, I entirely disagree with, with piracy and don't advocate what's happening. But what, what possible solution can there be when you have people starving to death? And what you realize in parts of Africa and in parts of the developing world is when you're living for survival today, you're willing to mortgage your future for tomorrow. You don't have a choice. You have to do that. And as a result of that, you start and you begin to create this vortex of violence that continues on, continues on, 
that, that mortgage becomes higher and higher and more pricely, more costly, and also more violent. So at what point do we stop that and realize that a lot of this violence isn't because the world hates the United States or hates, hates the UK or hates the West. It's because they really don't have much of a choice. If democracy is if it's what we're after, the very basis of democracy is choice. And it's the choice of living in the first and foremost. And so this very much has a, a point to it of, of hard security. I don't believe that you can have uh, sustainable development, and I get into these, these fights all the time with a lot of the development community. There's no such thing as a sustainable development when you cannot set the conditions for sustainable security. When you are having to fight for your life today, you do not care about your crop yields next year. You do not care about your 401k program. You do not care how much money you have in, in your, your savings account. All you care about is survival today. And so until we can shift that thinking, and this book is very much a book of language, because I also say that we can only achieve those things for which we have words. We can only achieve those things for which we can understand and discuss together. And right now, we very much have very different languages of what security is in 20th century terms and what development is in 20th century terms. But as far as I know, folks, we're not in the 20th century anymore. And we need to wake up and smell the empty beer can. We need to wake up and realize that the world continues to turn and the world continues to burn. And while we're sitting here arguing about we don't see the fire yet, there's a great possibility we'll all die of smoke inhalation. So what is it that we can do together to talk together, to bring together, rather than arguing apart in our silos of excellence and trying to protect our Fabergé rice bowl? What is it that we can do to bridge these gaps and say there is more that we have in common than we have in separation? There's more that we can do together to try to bring this language and try to bring people together than it is to wait until we have the fire at our doorsteps. So I sort of close with this, of what Mary said about you know, the, the difference between domestic and international. I take it sort of from an, an opposite perspective, which is from a security perspective, there is no such thing as international security and domestic security anymore. It very much is intermestic. And again, back to the Somali example. I'll take you to a place in the middle of America, smack dab in the middle of America, a place called Minneapolis, Minnesota. One of the largest ongoing FBI investigations is in Minneapolis, Minnesota because of suspected Somali terrorism. Now, how in the world could that be possible in Minneapolis, Minnesota? That's the difference. The world is a phone call away. Ten digits to destruction those kinds of things. We have to understand that. We have to get out of the 20th century mindset of talking about security in defense terms and start talking about security in the 21st century terms. It's no longer about the kinetics. It's no longer about the planes, the tanks, the guns, the massing of, of troops along a, a sovereign state border, defense budgets, those kinds of things. It's not about the kinetics. That is not what will drive security for the 21st century. It is very much a century of conditions. What are the conditions that create these instabilities? What are the conditions that create these insecurities? And we argue in the book very much that the forces we're going to face in the 21st century are not naval forces, are not air forces, are not ground forces. They're the forces of nature. To bring that home, I'll leave you with this. The two greatest attacks that have happened on the United States and the United States soil happened at the beginning of this century. Neither one of them were from a state-based or state-supported enemy. Those two attacks were 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina. And my question is, how prepared were we for those? Well, and the oil prepared? spill. And the oil spill on top of it. So I'll leave you with that, and I welcome uh, the questions and hope that we have a good discussion here and uh, hope to hear back from you. Thank you very much. Good. Well, this is all very well. Uh, yeah. Do you feel like saying a couple of minutes of response? Just, yeah. just yeah. very, very briefly. Um, in, we, we mentioned uh, briefly Srebrenica, and 
I was one of the prosecutors on that trial, um, and I and I certainly believe that there were there were two reasons that those events took place. There was a there was a failure in the UN mandate uh, that was actually given to the military forces within Srebrenica, but I also actually believe um, that there was clearly a lack of adequate military force within Srebrenica to protect the civilians that, that were there. There was a small Dutch contingent that was poorly armed um, and, and frankly were not prepared to fight. So they I think... Fought for it. They haven't fought a war for a couple of hours. So in, in that sense, the, the point I, I want to make is that um, I do believe in that particular situation, uh, the lack the lack of military force led to a situation uh, where individuals could not be properly protected. The second thing I wanted to say briefly, uh, and, and this actually relates to Darfur, um, if, if justice is actually a part of human security so that in essence um, individuals are made accountable for the crimes that they commit against their own people or against people of another state, then the international community has to actually enforce that mechanism. And if you take Darfur, um, and it's interesting, you mentioned the, the rape uh, incident in the, in the DRC, and it actually took me back to when I, when I was interviewing a, a refugee in this country who was a lady doctor from the Sudan who had been in Darfur um, at the time of some of the worst events in 2002, 2003. We, we believed at the time that rape was being used by the government as a weapon um, against the, the, the groups that had been targeted. So in, in essence, you, you're aware, I mean, Darfur is in, in essence a counterinsurgency campaign being run by the government against certain tribal groups within Darfur who are rebelling or have been rebelling against the government. And rape was being committed on a massive scale, but it was very difficult for us to actually prove um, that it was part of the government policy until we met this young lady doctor in this country who, by sheer coincidence, had actually treated um, a group of 40 young girls who'd been raped at a boarding school uh, in Darfur uh, after government forces had basically overrun this town. She, she treated uh, the, the, these, these young girls, and I mean, they, they ranged in age from about 8 to 12. Um, and she treated these, these young girls, and then subsequently Oxfam had been to her to take a statement on, on what she'd seen. Um, and she was reluctant to talk to them, mainly because the government had warned her off about saying anything. Um, subsequently, um, government agents within the military security services of the Sudanese army came to see her and warned her not to speak to Oxfam. Oxfam came back, they took a statement from her. She was then arrested and gang raped uh, in a military security camp in Darfur. So when we met her, um, she was able to tell us that Sudanese security agents had actually told her, yes, Rape basically is part of the government policy uh, in this counterinsurgency campaign within Darfur. Now, how does this relate to, to what we've just been talking about? Well, in the first case, we, we included rape. Because of this woman's statement, we were able to not only use the victim's evidence, those victims who'd actually been raped, but we could use the evidence of this lady doctor, uh, a refugee here, to, to demonstrate that this was actually part of the government's policy within Darfur. We, in, we, we, we indicted two people to begin with. First of all, the Deputy Minister of the Interior, who had been responsible for government policy in Darfur for the counterinsurgency campaign. And secondly, uh, we indicted a man called Ali Kashib, who was one of the Arab tribal leaders who'd been working with the government because the government essentially employed local Arab tribes to do the dirty work uh, in Darfur. And we had enough evidence basically connecting these two individuals. Subsequently, as you know, uh, al-Bashir was indicted for the same crimes. But what has the international community actually done 
to enforce this. I mean, as you know, basically nothing has been done. There are outstanding arrest warrants for, for these three individuals. They haven't been enforced. The African <laughs> Union is basically supporting al-Bashir and has condemned uh, the International Criminal Court's work in, in Darfur. Now, if <coughs> justice is part of human security, what kind of example does this actually set? Because in order for there to be human security, people, as I've said, individuals, leaders of countries need to know that they are going to be accountable for how they treat their own citizens. And if, if the, the work of the International Criminal Court is not enforced, if the warrants of arrest for these individuals are not enforced, then leaders will simply not feel that they are responsible because they know that they can essentially escape justice. Okay, uh, I think I'm not going to let you guys uh, go any further. Questions? Wow, okay. Uh, first, then, 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 yeah. Before we speak about uh, human security, I just wanted to check up with you whether any of you know how much human and material resources we have in the world and at what level per person or per family that can be shared or are we just talking because there is a finite amount of resources. If like one looks back in history and studies history, one sees that the reason the conditions were the way they are were because the resources were limited in those times. So as resources increased, that is it's the things got better as well. So have you looked into that? At okay, all? I'm going to a number of questions. So somebody here? Yeah, and then I'll, I'll go. I'll go down. Uh, yeah. Hello. Keep it short. I, I, I'll do my best. Um, first, I apologize. I haven't read the book yet, so maybe this is well covered in it. I wanted to ask about the concept of humanitarian space and the idea that there are certain organizations that can operate impartially, unaligned, and be accepted by both sides, and perhaps delivering some of these. That seems gone in Afghanistan and many other places. Is this a 20th century concept that we should abandon or sh can be rehabilitated? Okay, now at the back, okay, here. Uh, I'm trying to bring the linear way. But. Um, I'd like to ask what the new rules of war will be. I can hear people saying what they should be, but what will they be? Because of the forces that we've been, uh, we could think about humanitarian law, um, some successes with war crimes tribunals, but consequences to like leaving warships unable to stop those pirates that you mentioned for fear of um, complexities with, with human rights, problems that it may be difficult to support failing states because the Western personnel who do that may then be prosecuted for what goes wrong. Yeah. We have violence legislating, drone strikes becoming now at the center of state practice, and we have Afghanistan where actually not enough people will care long enough. Uh, we may lose Afghanistan there may be no human security, and even if it is a success, I doubt it will be repeated in that way ever again. Okay. Uh, people at the back, there are lots of people at the back. Uh, that gentleman at the right, right at the back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Frank Jackson, World Disarmament Campaign. Um, I start off by finding a Keep great deal to... Keep it short. Uh, I, I know it's, I it's, it's very, very difficult. There are so many uh, very big issues, Try. and I have got a. I would like to make a, a significant contribution. No, um, no, we, we have to share time. Yes, I am. I'm well, well aware of that, uh, and of course we've waited uh, some time by you uh, challenging me. So yes. um, I agree I'm with a great deal of what's said, but I don't find it satisfactory because I don't think it goes far enough. The uh, assumption, for example, that the international community, so-called, is, um, uh, is always based on goodwill. And I would like to suggest that the, uh, that, that is um, a bit of a fallacy. Um, 
accountable. Uh, what about the uh, people in the Western world, uh, about accountability for them, about George W. Bush, for example, uh, and um, going back in, in history, the people who were responsible for the uh, uh, Hiroshima uh, bombers, more. Uh, more. lots of other things, but I've just thrown these yeah, out to, 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 to start. Can I just say, I've got in my archives a picture uh, of a, a young militiaman in one of the uh, trouble states in um, in Africa, I forget which one for the moment, uh, but he's got a rifle, and on on the the butt of the rifle is written, "War is my food." Now, think about the significance of that. Someone s sufficiently articulate and intelligent to write that, and um, uh, that's part of the the situation okay. in in Africa. Thank you. Who else wants to ask question? Or shall I now take? Okay. Lady here, and, and then I'll stop and take answers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my name's Sandra Kaduri. I'm a communications consultant. Just very quickly, um, Zimbabwe, um, if ever I've thought of an example of where every other kind of diplomacy and intervention hasn't really worked, um, I think of Zimbabwe, and I wonder whether military okay. intervention would be the yeah. only thing that could stop uh, violations there. Uh, there's somebody around there who want, want to ask a question? Um, a question about justice. Um, how can we persuade supposed militants in uh, the federally administered tribal areas in Pakistan and in Afghanistan to leave the Taliban when the Taliban guarantees a fair and more efficient justice, some would argue, than the West and its puppet Afghan Pakistani government? Okay. And then lastly, this gentleman here. Some we can take from us. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I am I'm a refugee from Sri Lanka. I want to ask this question. And recent report from Human Rights Watch, International Crisis Group, and Amnesty International asking for an independent war crime investigation for recent war in Sri Lanka. Uh, I'd like to uh, get some uh, uh, feedback okay. from the panel, please. Yeah. Okay, uh, okay. okay. there's a lady here. I mean. Hi, this is a question for Shannon. Uh, I wanted to know what do you think the role of the Can military should be? Can you hold it close to Matt? Uh, yeah, hi. Hello. Um, what do you think the role of the military should be going forward? What? Role in the military. Oh, you heard it. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> Uh, now, I'm going to stop there and take answers. Who wants to go first? Shannon, you go first. Last question, last I'll, I'll, question. I'll try to field a couple of questions at once. Uh, and it, it ties into the idea of uh, a lot of the argument against the book is that this is uh, military intervention into a humanitarian space or the attempt for the military to bang from, and I hear this in the Pentagon all the time, and that's the reason I'll probably be fired and never see a full colonel. But uh, that being said, uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks within the Pentagon says this is, this is the banging of swords and the plowshares. It's not. Again, it's a matter of the language. It's a matter of trying to get these things before these creeping vulnerabilities become catastrophes that become combat, that become you know, uh, casualties. So the idea of humanitarian space is very much, we've seen that, and Mary and I have talked a lot about this, that we've seen it melt away after conflict starts, because there is no such thing as in today in, in uh, fifth, what we call fifth generation warfare of you know, separation of combatants and non-combatants. It's, it's everything blended together. So the challenge and the power of human security is to try to reach those things before they become conflict, before they become combat. So is it in Department of Defense and is it in the military's interest to ensure the success of folks that have the comparative advantages in, in, in organizations that do the development and do these other types of activities? Absolutely. What we have to be careful of, and what I see all the time, is a lot of the NGO community saying, we don't deal with the military. Well, the question is why, and it goes back to the language. If we can speak a common language, it's easier to understand. But yes, I understand that in Afghanistan and some of these other places that once the military has gone in and broken things, that the NGOs that try to work with the military are often seen as, as intelligence patsies or, or as targets. I get that. I understand that. And what we try to say is, look, we don't want to use Iraq and Afghanistan as the norms for the 21st century. We want those to be the anomalies. And to the question of, of resources, and I see this all the time in Africa, and it folds very much into uh, the, the uh, uh, war is my food, very much is. When you don't have these resources, and we're going to start seeing a lot more of this with water. We're going to start seeing a lot more of this with some of these other resource areas because people, again, are struggling for very basic survival today. And if we cannot find a way of providing for, again, a choice of life 
and that's the basis of democracy, then what else can we do? And I argue this a lot of times that, you know, in our, our higher levels of foreign policy, we, we go to Africa and we talk about, you know, democracy and transparency. And that. I say, hold out your hands. How much democracy and transparency do I have to put in your hands to feed you for a day? People don't care about democracy. They don't care about transparency. They don't care about a lot of these, these advanced kind of ideas when they're starving today. They will do whatever they have to do today to survive. So until we can provide for those basic needs, empower these communities. Do we have that? I, I think, absolutely, I think we have the technologies. I absolutely do. And one of the arguments that I get all the time, and particularly as it relates to Africa, is we're not doing enough in Africa. And I'm sort of the skunk at the party that stands up and says, is it the question we're not doing enough in Africa, or is it the question we're not doing enough together in Africa? And I can give you example after example after example. The easiest way in Africa to determine which one is a ministry building is which one has the rotating door. Because one organization goes in and talks in, in glad hands and, and dumps money in that ministry while another organization is coming out and ne'er shall the, the two meet because we're not talking together. And we discuss that a lot in the book. So we'll, I'll, I'll we'll, close there and, we'll and move let on. Let other people and we'll, yeah. Okay, yeah, Mary. I think this question about humanitarian space actually goes to the heart of what the book's about. Because I think, you know, you see a problem that humanitarian space is disappearing, that NGOs and international agencies in Iraq found they were becoming a target. And so after the you know, the attack on the UN in Iraq. There was a big thing going back. We've got to preserve humanitarian space. We've got to keep ourselves separate from the military. But that wasn't a solution either. And at the heart of what we're talking about is you can't, if the military are doing conventional war fighting, then there is no humanitarian space. And so actually, it's the military that have to change the way they do things. So while I completely agree about Srebrenica, there are ways in which you protect Srebrenica uh, which are not the same as conventional war fighting. And that's what's quite difficult to understand. So the job of the military is, has to change. Probably we wouldn't even call them military in the future. And their job is to create humanitarian space rather than in which NGOs and others can help, rather than to talk about humanitarian space as keeping NGOs separate from the military. So that's, that's a big change in the way of thinking. I also, you know, in answer to Paul's question and the issue of Afghanistan and Iraq, I just do think we have to take into account the fact that these started as conventional wars. It's only sort of halfway through at the surge that suddenly the American military turned around and said, actually, shooting at people has caused people to shoot us back. And so the level and intensity of these wars are much greater than any other wars we've seen recently. So in some senses, they are an anomaly, even though you have to try to think of human security ways out. I obviously couldn't agree more with Andrew about the key and central importance of justice, and maybe we didn't make push that enough in the book, but it is absolutely central. And I also agree very much with Frank that a huge problem with the International Criminal Court is, and it's been a huge problem since the Second World War, because obviously at Nuremberg, we did not deal with Dresden, Tokyo, Hiroshima and bombing, you know, is actually, in my view, a war crime of that kind, where masses of civilians get killed. But we've never dealt with that. We never, and, and I think that is a huge problem because people who are victims don't understand why Bush and Blair, for example, are not guilty too. Because uh, for them, you know, we say, well, when we go to war, this is just collateral damage. But from a the perspective of the victim, does it make any difference whether you're killed as a result of a massacre or whether you're killed as a result of an airstrike? Yeah. Let, let me, let me, let me uh, Andrew, do you want to say something? Uh, For, bri briefly. Yeah. Um, um, the, the issue that the gentleman raised about uh, Sri Lanka, um, 
The difficulty um, in Sri Lanka, actually, is first of all, Sri Lanka is not a signatory to the Rome Statute. So the International Criminal Court cannot have jurisdiction, even for those crimes that actually took place after it was established, unless the prosecutor acts to address those crimes himself. So it, in, in other words, the International Criminal Court really can't deal with the crimes, uh, the alleged crimes that took place in Sri Lanka. The only way they could ever be dealt with is if a special court was, was set up to do that. And it would have to be in the same form as the court that was established in Cambodia with, with the participation of the government. And it's unlikely that the government is, is going to participate in that because many of the crimes were actually committed by the government in both sides. Um, committed crimes. So that's, that's the problem that, that you have in, in Sri Lanka. I mean, there has been a, a preliminary inquiry, I know. I mean, there, there was a UN preliminary inquiry into the crimes, but I doubt, frankly, that, that it's, uh, it, it's going to lead anywhere. What about the Yugoslav Tribunal? No, because... Example, the, couldn't the Security Council the, create the, such the, a court? The Security Council could create such a court, but it's highly unlikely now that any that any court will be established along those lines again um, be, because of the cost actually um, that that's that's but the China, problem China, you know China would be the, and, and China China would also have a problem um, yeah, point, I, I, I'm aware you want to ask a question I'm just trying to get some answers to questions okay, yeah. um, the point that the gentleman raised at the back and in fact you touched on it um, about the issue that, it, that that justice is selective to an extent that there are individuals who probably do warrant investigation um, by the International Criminal Court. My, my answer to that is this. I mean, it's absolutely clear um, that complaints have been lodged with the International Criminal Court against Tony Blair uh, for, for the war in Iraq and indeed in Afghanistan. Um, and the prosecutor hasn't followed up on that, as is his discretion. Of course, that's for political reasons. Um, because at this, at the time that, that we're in now, and the you know the International Criminal Court has only existed for a very short period of time, they simply can't go against a state like the United Kingdom. You also have to remember that the International Court um, operates on a principle of complementarity, um, which means simply that the states themselves are expected to investigate alleged crimes, and the ICC will only intervene where a state is unable or actually unwilling to investigate the crime itself. Um, and certainly one would expect, and indeed you know, there, there is evidence to support this, that the United Kingdom would actually investigate it, allegations of war crimes itself prior to the intervention of the International uh, Criminal Court. But in fact, Arlen yeah. and I have been in discussion about this because he's making a um, a program for Panorama on this very issue that there are a number of war crimes, alleged war crimes, committed by uh, allegedly committed by British troops that have not been uh, investigated by the government, and the question arises as to whether or not the International Criminal Court would intervene. The hope always is, of course, that the United Kingdom would properly uh, investigate those crimes and would prosecute them if indeed there was a case to prosecute. Two of the members of Parliament from SNP hired Matrix Chambers to investigate whether a case could be made against Tony Blair. They claim that as expenses. Uh, and so we have a record. <laughs> no, seriously. No, I mean, this is a serious point. Some people tried to explore from Matrix Chambers, which is a high-powered human rights organization, uh, and they said they couldn't, they couldn't be sure that a case could be made. I mean, I'm just saying that. Uh, secondly, I just want to say one thing. In the Tokyo trials, there is a superb judgment by an Indian judge who disagreed with the majority. And you should read it because one of the, one of the most stunning pieces of uh, discussion on justice as to why the trial itself was illegitimate. Oh, really? Yeah, and I'll, I'll give you the reference later on. A man called Ashish Nandi was a distinguished Indian scholar, yeah. N-A-N-D-Y, if anybody wants to know. Distinguished Indian scholar and uh, psychologist and various other things. He did a long essay on this as to how very few people outside, outside India know this, that there was this very long judgment by this man. He said he disagreed with the Tokyo court that these people could be brought to trial by the victors. 
Why should the victors have the right to try the losers? Okay. Now, that lady has been dying to ask a question. <laughs> Hello, I'm Carolyn Heyman from Peace Direct. Um, I really enjoyed listening, particularly to your um, speech, Shannon. But then right at the end, I really took exception to what you said. I, I think you're perpetuating an idea that everyone in Africa is starving and the only thing they care about is food. But that's clearly not true. And there are lots of people in Africa who care a lot about accountability. And I think my hope for the 21st century is that we stop talking about what we can do for them and we start reflecting on all the things that we could stop doing that would be extremely beneficial. And I'll just give you some examples. We could stop giving very but large amounts sure, of money sure. to post-conflict countries before we put any accountability mechanisms in place. We could stop um, allowing people to hide their ill-gotten gains in Swiss bank accounts. We could stop yeah, selling I think, weapons. I think, I think you made and, your point. And, can we I could just do more say for one them. more thing? Please. And, and, and we could stop creating wars. And I want to particularly talk about Somalia. Somalia was the most peaceful Ramadan in 2006. And we had a relatively benign Islamic courts government. And the Security Council decided that that wasn't acceptable and allowed Ethiopia to invade. And the problems in Somalia are the, are the responsibility of the Security look, look, Council. It's inequitable to your fellow people here to take up so much time. I think what I'm saying the is important. The back. The back. The back. Um, thank you. You said the uh, military has to change the way it does things. And I'm wondering um, which military has to change. Is it the Americans or the United Nations peacekeepers or the British? Thank you. Gentlemen here. No, you, you, you are being recorded. You're being recorded for training purposes. So, 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 so we have to have you. Then listen in. Uh, Shannon, I'd be very surprised if expressing views as a British Army officer as you did, you'd made it beyond captain. It simply wouldn't happen. A, a year ago, a uh, British officer, a colonel, sat in that very seat and um, uh, claimed uh, credit because some of his men did not fire a rocket at a, a house with civilians in it. Anyway, the question is, uh, are you, and particularly to Mary, are you talking either literally or figuratively to the British military? I'd be very surprised if there were two or three military officers here. Yeah, okay. Good, uh, Anna and then, uh, because Anna because she has paid uh, for my drink. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I feel worried uh, listening to all this about the, the supposed altruism somehow of the military. No one's really talked about the money. I interviewed uh, Andy McNabb in an interview that's on the site today. He was in the SAS, he was captured and tortured. He now writes books. He also runs a private security company. And he's very clear that war and politics go together and it's all about the money. People are making an absolute fortune out of war and they don't want to stop. And the other thing that he's very clear about is that soldiers absolutely love it. I mean, your speech was incredibly moving. I genuinely nearly cried when you said the thing about the soldier who wants peace. I. I worry that that's just not true. I mean, people volunteer for second tours. Young men, you know, fueled with adrenaline, want to kill each other. We're mammals. They want to get out killing people. A lot of people do. We find that very unacceptable in our society. We can't handle it. We hope it's not true. It seems to me, I mean, if you read Freud's Civilization and his you discontent, you'd get well. very uh, depressed. Don't well. bully me, Meg. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can, I can, and I will. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, I'm cowed, I'm cowed, I'm cowed. Uh, the, the, the one behind. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Keith. Um, a very brief point, I promise. Um, you talk, uh, Mary, you were talking about the military. If you take the Kosovo campaign, that was trying to protect a human population, but it was done through air power. Yeah. And if you look at what has happened, it was the military themselves. It wasn't civilians who changed the surge. It was Jack Keane, a retired mil military officer, who did it. And that says to me that the military are actually waking up to this. My question, though, comes from, I can see your strategy. I, I, I can largely agree with it. But how do you implement that tactically now? If you are General McChrystal and you are on the ground, you're facing an enemy that is not killing out of need for food or anything like that. It's dropped suicide bombs to children. Now, if you want to go and combat them, I don't know that holding back 
Maybe the policy of courageous restraint, as we see now, maybe that will work or not. But I'm very curious as to how you would actually implement that when you're faced with an enemy as vicious as we do today, without giving succor and encouragement to them. Okay. I think I'll take a, that question over there. Yeah, thank you. I just want to comment on the issue on uh, international justice concerning uh, the ICC. Um, there seems to be a serious gap in the system itself. Uh, I think earlier on you mentioned about um, selective justice. And up to now, yeah, ICC has been called to investigate thoroughly the crimes around the Great Lake region, including Congo where there are heads of state sitting around the area who have not been indicted at all. There are generals who are working in, with government forces in Congo by the name of Bosco Nataganda is wanted by the ICC. Congo is a, a signatory to the treaty. How come that is not being apprehended? And my question really, in that diminishing, actually, the credibility of ICC, no wonder you said African Union is in support of al-Bashir. That could probably explain why. Thank you. Okay. Finally, there's one question at the back, and that will be the last question. Then I'll, I'll, I'll take the answers. I, uh, I wondered what shape uh, the military of your sort of idealized future would take. It's easy to designate infantry units and train them for infantry missions, logisticians, engineers, armored units. Um, is not one of the possible conclusions you could take from the last sort of 20 years of intervention is that we've asked the military as a preformed body of people who can be moved across the world as, to use them as a sort of catch-all force where we don't have police or judges or uh, all these other types of organizations we would need. Are you not inviting then a, a possible nightmare scenario for the military that they're being asked? It's very difficult to define what their role would be um, compared to what has gone in the past, uh, that we're broadening too much their role and that really it goes back to putting it at the center of the policymaker. And if anything, you could argue that it's to bring the military back to only being used for the application of force and that we need to grow the other areas of state apparatus. Thank you. Okay. Now, I'll start with you. Um, very briefly, actually, the, the point that, that the lady that you cut yeah. off uh, down here. Um, I cut off everybody. Yeah, you, cut off, you, you, you haven't cut off me because I'm being very brief. but. Um, I, I actually ag agree with you about um, you know, the way money has been spent, and I, and I think Cambodia is an absolutely classic example of basically a government that runs 99.9% .9 on development aid, and probably of that money, um, about 2% goes to the people, and about 98% goes to government officials. Um, so I think you're right. I mean, I'm not a development specialist, but just lo looking at that, um, it, it seems to me very unfair and it, and, and, and it needs to be addressed and of course the, the government is constantly saying unless we get all this money you know the country's going to implode into civil war again indeed the work I'm doing uh, the, the government is also saying that if we prosecute too many people that uh, civil war will begin again so I absolutely wholeheartedly agree with you that the delivery of aid has got to be modified and there's got to be a lot more accountability on how money is spent because you see in many of these countries that rely heavily on development aid that the gap between rich and poor is unbelievable and in Cambodia you see people living in the streets outside palaces <laughs> in, in which government officials are living in so I, I really agree with you and certainly Cambodia's made a huge impression on me in that respect. The question for the gentleman on, on the, the ICC, um, I think what you identify is a more general problem with the International Criminal Court, that it's exclusively operating in, in, in Africa. I mean, it's, uh, the, the, the concentration of all of the work is in Africa. As you know, the, the problem is, is that the court has to really rely on the cooperation of the state's parties, so individuals can only be arrested if a member state actually arrest that person um, and you know al-Bashir himself as you know has already traveled in and in and around Africa um, and has not actually been arrested I'm not sure whether he's actually traveled to a member state but the court relies for enforcement on the member states and if the member states don't act together then there's actually very little uh, that can be done so so you're right basically I mean hopefully 
over the coming decades and centuries the court stature will develop but without enforcement by the state's parties nothing can happen and certainly the Sudan itself which is not obviously a state's party that was a case that came to the court via a Security Council resolution um, and obviously the Sudanese are not going to arrest their own president and, and send him uh, to stand trial in, in the court. So, you know, I, I agree with you in terms of the, the, the limitations of the authority of the court. Okay, Mary. Well, there were a lot of questions about the military. Did I talk to the military? Which military? Uh, what will be the role of the military in the future? On did I talk to the military? Yes, a lot. And there are a lot of people in the British military, certainly, who think along these lines. Um, and who feel frustrated, often, because they feel their political masters often don't get it. I also think, actually, for the British military, 9-11 and Iraq and Afghanistan sort of pushed them backwards in a different direction. And that's been very problematic, too. Secondly, on where are we going in the future, I don't want, I'm certainly not arguing that the military should be taking over development roles. I'm really arguing that what we need in the future is something probably that isn't even called military. In the book, we talk about engagement brigades. We talk about really that what we need is kind of global emergency forces similar to what you have in a well-run country. Ideally, of course, we're nowhere near that. You need, when you have crises like Haiti, like Hurricane Katrina, like 9-11, what you need are health services, police services, firefighters, and you may need more, and, and in more violent situations, you may need people trained as military to act in more robust ways, as you did in Srebrenica, and as you probably do in Afghanistan. So it's a sort. So the engagement brigades would be now we call them military, civil, but actually I think in the end you'd have a whole set of new types of people with different skills. And when you say which military, when I say global expeditionary forces, I mean, it would be nice to have a peace force under the control of the United Nations, obviously, ideally, but we're a very long way from that. But I certainly think a very key element in what we talk about is that if you do use military forces, they have to operate within the framework of international law, which means, by and large, they have to be authorized by the United Nations Security Council. So... You know, they may be... So are you in peacekeeping forces? Yeah, or they might be more robust peacekeeping forces. No. But yes, I mean, I think, you know, the, the law is very clear on this. I mean, the UN Charter prohibited the use of military force except in self-defense or under the authorization of the UN Security Council. And so we're not saying anything new. We're just saying that's how it should be. Um, somebody said, well, what do you do when the Taliban are suicide? What do you, you know, how do you defeat them? We keep saying over and over again, the goal is protecting people. Ideally, of course, you can't with suicide bombers. Ideally, you arrest them. And of course, you have a right to self-defense. But the key point is, the emphasis is not so much on defeating the enemy. The problem with emphasizing the defeat of the enemy, the problem with sending drone attacks or airstrikes against, is that you create, you, in a way, you elevate the enemy and you mobilize more recruits to the cause. And that's what's happening. It's a sort of vicious circle that gets worse and worse. And because it's dangerous for ordinary people in Afghanistan, they think, well, maybe I'll get more protection from the Taliban than I'm going to get from the Americans. And that's what's going on. So, you know, this is, so that's why protection is central. Finally, I want to talk about Anna's question. But what I want to emphasize, a point that Anna and I have discussed, is that soldiers uh, have to operate within the laws of war. And the reason they have to operate is not just because there is such a thing as the laws of war, but because they are legitimate agents of the state. What makes a soldier um, allowed to 
to be allowed to kill, what makes him different from the criminal is that he operates within a system of law. And even though soldiers break that, that's a very important part of their mentality. Now, I think what's happened is that there is a genuine security gap in the world. There are lots of very insecure places, but our military forces are not trained to deal with those insecure places. And the result has been an explosion of private security contractors. And those private security contractors do not operate within the same strict legal regime as soldiers do. They get paid huge amounts more. The soldiers are badly paid, not very well motivated, and instead we're allowing these private security companies. They don't have casualties either, apparently. Government lockdowns because they don't have casualties. Stunning. And the worst thing, I mean, Marika and I were talking about this, is that they actually recruit private contractors from criminals and abusers. So. This is a huge problem today, and unless we get our act together at the level of soldiers and policemen, legitimate agents of the state, the risk is that we get an emerging market of people who do do it for money and adventure. And that, I think, is a terribly dangerous trend in the world today. Dylan? I'll just answer a couple of questions uh, to, your, to your questions on, on Africa. Uh, if you haven't read the book, don't worry about reading chapter nine. That's the Africa chapter because you, you said pretty much everything that I said in the chapter, which is this. I started off, I, I briefed the uh, chief of staff of the army and the senior staff there, and I started off the briefing with two things. First off, Africa is a continent, it's not a country. And secondly, there's a reason Africa is shaped like a question mark because we really don't understand it. So the point that I was trying to make is, is that these, these broad sweeping generalities that AIDS is killing Africa, that, you know, that, that's, you, you have to have some context, you have to have some, uh, in political science terms, specificity um, of, the, uh, of the argument. So I'm not saying that all of Africa is starving. As a matter of fact, there's lots of parts of Africa that are doing really well with food. There's also lots of parts of Africa that, that don't even really understand what AIDS and HIV is about. There's lots of parts of Africa that don't understand what terrorism is about, but it's a big place. It's three and a half times the size of the United States. So again, we have to look at the specificity of the problems there and address those. So no, I'm not saying that all of Africa is, is, uh, is, is, is dying of, of food starvation. Um, to, to the issue, and Mary discussed a little bit about the engagement brigades, and I think that uh, talks a little bit to, uh, to the issues of how does the, the military transform itself. No, the military shouldn't be doing all of these things. But here's the reality. The military is having to do a lot of this because there is not capacity there in any of the other organizations right now, or those other organizations are refusing to work with the military, or, or, and, and, and so on and so forth. Guess what? There is no such thing as a vacuum when it comes to, to security in the world. Somebody's going to fill it. It's either going to be the military, it's going to be a transnational criminal organization, it's going to be a defense contractor, it's going to be something. So again, wake up and smell the empty beer can, folks. All right? We don't live in a perfect world. We certainly don't live in a world of, you know, of, of, of sitting around holding hands and, and saying kumbaya, things are going to happen that are dirty, that are violent, and we have to realize those things. When I, when I work in Africa, I say it is what it is. I can't put my rosy lenses of what it should be. I have to deal with what I'm seeing on the ground and how I react to that and respond to that is based on what I'm seeing on the ground. So again, that's what we have to look at right now, and it goes back to the language. I encourage you all, please, please, please read the book, because a lot of the things that we're discussing a lot of these arguments would not even be happening if we were discussing this in terms of human security. A lot of these issues and events would not even get to the brink of destruction, to catastrophe, those kinds of things, if we would look at this through a, a common language. And that's really the challenge. And until that point, yes, we're going to have defense contractors filling those gaps. Yes, we are going to have an overlap of the military doing things. And trust me, the military. They, they don't enjoy doing these things very much. They're confused a lot of times. A lot of my friends say, this is not what I joined the military to do. Matter of fact, when I came in the military back in 1991, and I, I alluded to this last night, that George Bush Sr. gave his thousand points of light speech in my graduation at West Point. And as we were preparing to go into the Balkans, we said, well, if there were a thousand points of light, there's sure a whole hell of a lot of busted light bulbs out there. So again, the world has changed. And we have to get our hands around that because the world continues forward. Very good. I've, I know. I, I think I've, I, we're getting thrown out at what time? Eight thirty. Okay. I, I, I sort of judged that. So uh, sorry about that. 
uh, uh, <laughs> no, I, I just want to offer offer one one uh, thought because of uh, Lord Shannon has been talking about a common language and Mary has been. The problem is that the world is not a community. It ought to be. And as a great GWF Hegel said, we are marching towards the idea, but there are many more dialectical contradictions before we get there. I agree. <laughs> on that profound thought or not. Thank you all very much. Thank you for your speaking. Thank you, Andrew.